Amen, amen, I say to you, unless the grain of wheat falling into the ground die, itself remaineth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world keep it unto life eternal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. St. Teresa of Jesus, the great Carmelite mystic, points out how the devil is given license by God to tempt us before big feast days. Most notably, Holy Week. Now, she writes, it comes especially during Holy Week when prayer is my delight. What happens is that my intellect is suddenly seized by things sometimes so trivial that at other times I would laugh about them. So, during this coming Holy Week, the devil is sure to come around and tempt us. All of his temptations can be reduced to one thing. Calm down. Come down from that cross. Give up. Give in. So he will beset us with many troubles and temptations and, well, irrational fears. Something might happen this week, this coming week, that will set us off. Be on your guard. So let us take this temptation of the devil as our theme for our day of recollection, this come down from the cross. And of course, we will talk about the remedies. So how is it that we are tempted to come down from the cross? How is it that we so easily lay down our crosses or fail to take them up? I think you will be edified and surprised by the end of the day as to how these things happen in our daily lives. Let us begin with our Lord. Now consider the means His Majesty chose to undo the evil of sin. He chose the cross. And right at the start, we must understand that God chose the cross among many other possibilities, which means that Christ did not necessarily have to die on the cross. At first, this almost sounds heretical because it's a historical fact. It's a done deal. This is how we're saved. But let's consider this truth by returning to the scene where St. Peter makes his first infallible statement. You know about it. It's in Matthew 16. It's at Caesarea Philippi. Jesus asked them, Who do men say that I am? And we know that St. Peter came forward and he professed our Lord to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, by the power of the Heavenly Father. In this scene, we see one of the clearest scriptural references to infallibility and why we call the Pope Holy Father. But recall what happened next in this scene. Following the pronunciation of Christ's divinity by St. Peter, the first Pope, our Lord explained that he must go to Jerusalem and be tried and be rejected and scourged and crucified and die. In other words, Christ did not want to be known as the Christ without Calvary. They go together. So if you've professed me to be the Christ, well, that goes with this. It goes with Calvary. Now, Peter, what did he do? Well, he made a mistake in judgment. Saying, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. He is rebuked by the Lord, even called Satan, and told to get behind him. The Lord is, as it were, saying, I lead you, Peter. You don't lead me. So anytime a pope tries to go out in front of Christ and do something on his own, he becomes a Satan. He must get behind Christ and follow and teach what has always been taught and preserve the doctrine that has always been given to us. It's called the deposit of the faith. Pope's job is to preserve the deposit of the faith from all encroachments from this world, and from the devil and his lies. Well, just think about this. All this happened just after making his first infallible statement. So he makes an infallible statement, then he makes a fallible one. Infallible, fallible. Well, how could Peter make a mistake? Is he not the Pope? Is he not infallible? 
Now, it seems to me the reason follows from the fact that the means chosen by Christ to save us, namely His passion, was among many possible ways to save us. It was not a matter of infallibility, but a matter of choice of means to an end. Whenever that is the case, whenever we have a choice of means to an end, the Pope cannot rule infallibly, saying this is the only way. Infallibility has to do with truths that are necessary for our salvation and cannot be any other way. So we should not be surprised to discover that the church has no defined teaching on exactly why God chose this particular way to redeem us. But let's be very clear. Nothing within, nothing interior to God or to man necessitated the passion, absolutely speaking. Furthermore, no exterior compulsion forced God into the passion, nor necessitated our Lord's free act of dying on the cross. But nevertheless, God chose this means from all eternity to redeem us and save us. He built it into the universe. At the center of this universe, which He chose, stands Calvary. It is unavoidable. Did our, our Lord say in the gospel today, he said, and if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all things to myself. To which St. John adds, now this he said, signifying what death he should die. This is why St. Paul repeats himself in saying to the Galatians, they that are Christ have crucified their flesh with the vices and the concupiscences. And in another place, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. This is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. How was he slain? Crucifixion. Could he have been slain in some other way? Yes, but he chose this way. And elsewhere, St. Paul says that if we die with Christ, we will rise with Christ. If we're going to rise with Christ, we need to die with Christ. How did die Christ die? On Calvary. So when we're baptized, we're baptized into Calvary. It's built in. It can't be avoided. So if we do not take up our crosses in this life and die with Christ, then we'll have to finish the job by being crucified in purgatory. Everyone must be crucified no matter what. Those who do so while still on earth become saints right away. Those who resist God and do not finish the job on earth must be crucified in purgatory but without gaining any merits. No fruits. But what of those who reject God's cross altogether? They are eternally crucified in hell. There's no escaping it. In the end, due to the way God made this universe, we will all be stigmatists. We will all bear the marks of Christ, so to speak, just as our Lord still bears them in heaven. They're the one thing he kept. So St. Paul declares at the end of his letter to the Galatians, I bear the wounds, the marks of Christ on my body. Now, this is the way God chose to make this universe. He ordained it to be this way, even though it could have been otherwise. In other words, our Lord could have died in some other way than crucifixion. But we know that he's given us many prophecies, many types in the Old Testament to show this is how it's going to be done. We can think of Abraham and Isaac. Isaac's got the wood on his back. They're going up a mountain. He's bound on the wood. He's about ready to be sacrificed symbolizing Calvary. What is more, even one single act of love by the God-man is of infinite value. One act of love, able to wipe away all sin of man, to satisfy God's justice. Now, when did he make that first act of love as the God-man? But at the first instant of his incarnation, that was enough. This is another reason why we genuflect 
whenever we mention the Incarnation because, in a way, we're already saved right there. Ultimately, the answer is as to why the Passion, God chose it as the most fitting way to redeem man. That's the answer of St. Thomas and many of the fathers. And this fittingness can be shown in many ways. At the top of the list, God desired to show us the depth of His love. It would bring greater glory to Him as well. True love requires true sacrifice. Infinite love requires infinite sacrifice. A lamb that is slain from the foundation of the world, an eternal sacrifice. Not only was He going to provide us with grace and expiation, atonement and satisfaction for sin, but He would do this in a super abundant manner. Yes, he could have, that one act of love could have been enough. That one drop of blood from His circumcision would have been enough. No, He wants to do super abundant satisfaction, atonement, expiation for all of our sins. Now we're in a position to see just how the devil could tempt our Lord because at least two possibilities fall out of this. And they're opposite, but they have the same end in mind. Okay, number one. The sin of Adam and all mortal sins have an infinite aspect to them because they offend an infinite God. Even though the thing we're turning to is not infinite, they're offending somebody who is infinite. Then they simply are too much for the Christ to undo. Too much. And the devil's going to prove it to him. He shows him Judas who would despair and come to him, that is the devil, his father, below as the son of perdition. He would show him all the poor sinners in hell, saying, see, your infinite act of love is not enough. It didn't work. Look at all these people that are mine. He showed them all the seemingly numberless past sins of men, and how these would continue and even increase in the future, showing him the future tyrants, dictators, concentration camps, abortion mills, and worst of all, the sacrileges committed against our Lord in the Eucharist, saying, this is too much for any man. You cannot do it. Give up. Come down from that cross. Have we not been tempted in this way in our own lives? Having too much on our plate, maybe? Someone else has trod in this road and they kept going and they brought about wonderful fruits and were fruits of that very sacrifice of our Lord. That's why we're here today. Well, second of all, there's the opposite. Something like, all this isn't necessary. Why are you doing this? You've done enough. It's sufficient. One drop of blood, that's enough. You've already done that. You can go home now. Why go to all this trouble and all this suffering? Have we not been tempted in that way too? I've done enough. I give up. Well, by taking up our crosses, we will conform ourselves to the way this universe is constructed from the very beginning. We will find ourselves in good company we will be with our Lord, the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world, the Lamb who would not be known apart from Calvary. Now this brings us to Calvary, and that brings us to much merit, for it is there that we gain the merit to save souls, bring glory to God. We gain fruit that will endure unto all eternity. Let us then resolve now with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength to accept our crosses and bear them with love of God, nay, even to love our crosses. Remember, those who go to purgatory, they are crucified and it's much more painful and they get no fruit from it. There's no merit coming out of purgatory. Pure purification. Now, I'd like to end with a story of St. John Vianney. You can see the power of loving your cross. When he first came to ours, 
known to be the coldest place in the diocese. He had many trials, but he never seems to have given in to human respect. He had many trials, but he didn't give in. So, for example, he preached long sermons. Hmm? One man in the community was asked about these sermons. He says, did uh, the curé preach long sermons? He said, yes, long ones, and always on hell. He would strike his hands together saying, my children, you are lost. With such sermons and his continuous effort to eradicate dancing and public drinking from the town, many started to attack him with calumnies. They wanted to get rid of him. We're sick of this priest. Spread all kinds of unsavory rumors about him. For example, the neighbor girl to the rectory gave birth to a child out of wedlock. Some tried to say the curé was the father. Now here's a man who loves virginity, loves purity. Such rumors disgusted him that he was so disgusted that he was tempted to leave the parish. But a good man, a good friend showed him that such an action would only serve to verify the rumor. To make matters worse, all of these things lasted for something along the lines of five years and during a time when ours was given over to another diocese, the Diocese of Belay, where it was under Lyon before, and he did, the bishop didn't know the curé. The saint also struggled often with his homilies, getting stuck in the middle of them and having to leave the pulpit in shame. Such incidences and other trials coming from hell upon which he was waging war caused the curé to make this remark. If on my arrival at ours, I had foreseen that all that I was to suffer there, I should have died on the spot. Now, maybe we could just substitute ours something else, our marriage. If I had seen all the trials of my marriage, I would have died on the spot. Raising children, living a religious life, being a priest. Well, then, what did he do? It's amazing that later on the curé said that these were the happiest times of his life, by the way. In hindsight, he could look back and say, those five years were the happiest. Listen to what he says. I thought a time would come when the people would rout me out of ours with sticks, when the bishop would suspend me, and I should end my days in prison. I see, however, that I am not worthy of such a grace. Truly, the cross that weighed on him was proportional to his destiny. But once he embraced it, he kissed it and loved it. Think of the second station. How much lighter it felt. Listen to his words. To suffer lovingly is to suffer no longer. To flee from the cross is to be crushed beneath its weight. We should pray for a love of the cross. Then it will become sweet. Let's repeat that. We should pray for a love of the cross then it will become sweet. I experienced my, it myself during four or five years. I was grievously calumniated and contradicted. Oh, I did have crosses, almost more than I could bear. Then I started praying for a love of crosses and I felt happy. I said to myself, verily, there is no happiness but in the cross. What a great lesson this saint has to offer us. He shows us that his unshakable faith and never yielding to discouragement enabled him to carry out great works that others more talented and less supernaturally motivated would have failed to execute. Most people would have ran away, in other words. The smarter ones would have left. His life demonstrates what moral greatness and what merit can be won from the humiliations of this life from loving our cross. Let us pray with St. John to love our crosses, for God will provide the strength for us to carry them and to die upon them out of love. So I encourage you to say the Stations of the Cross today and to pray them with the intention of loving your cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This morning, we talked about how we have to overcome ourselves.
through take up our crosses, to love our crosses. Now, St. Teresa of Jesus, she says that we should never leave the path of self-knowledge. Well, we can discover our cross in our life through self-knowledge. When we know ourselves, we will find a cross to carry. One way to look at ourselves is to consider, is to understand that there's three images of ourselves. There's the image that we have of ourselves. If I asked you who you think you are, you could write it out and describe yourself as best you can. So we have this idea of who we are. So we have this one image. Now, God sees us as we are right now. He sees us as we really are. He sees through everything. So there's this image of us. Now, do you think these images are the same? No, these are very different, aren't they? The saints would want to know about themselves, what they look like, and sometimes God would show them and they'd almost faint with grief in a way because like, oh my goodness, that's me? And then there is the image that God wants us to be. In other words, the image of what we'll be like in heaven. Perfect saints in heaven. So you have the final image of you. You have the image that God has of you right now. And you have the image of yourself as you think you are. There are three images of us. Our job is to take those first two images and make them one. We're to know ourselves as God knows us. And then we will have at least two images of ourselves and then we work on that to bring it to the third image which is the image of the saint and we know there are there's at least one person who was only one image always and that's our lady it can be done and it has been done and the saints all worked to bring them into one and they were successful one way we can examine these images as it were one way we can gain self-knowledge about ourselves is to, we have to construct a mirror into our souls. And we're going to look at the sower and the seed. But before we do that, we live with other people all the time. We oftentimes know all their faults, or at least a number of them that come out. They oftentimes don't see those faults as well as we do. We see others' faults more readily than we see our own. And so if we ask someone else, what are my faults? They probably will tell you. But generally speaking, you won't accept it. We don't like being told what our faults are by other people. So that's why it's better that we discover them ourselves. Once we discover them, we want to overcome them because we're embarrassed by them. If someone else tells us, we can almost become proud that we've got them. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm not changing because of you. That's what the problem is. So let's say that a couple, this is really happens a lot in marriage, a couple is having trouble. All right. They go and they ask advice what to do. What's, what's generally done today? Psychology has taken hold. So you need to go see a counselor. So they go see a counselor. And the counselor gets them to confess their problems. And what ends up happening is, is this person tells all the faults of that person why this person's driving them crazy. And then this person tells all the reason why this person's driving them crazy. Guess what? They both learn about what they think of each other now. It's all out in the open. Now they go home. Well, we got it all out. It may seem to work. But then what happens is, is that nobody changes. You see, yeah, they'll, they'll be careful. I know that really bugs her, so I'll walk on eggshells about that thing and not do it, because if I do it, it'll upset her, but I'm not changing. There's, I don't see what's the big deal. See, there's no conversion inside. It's very rare to find someone who will actually convert through one of these counseling sessions. There's no conversion of heart. We just learn where, where the people's buttons are, where... They get mad. If I do this, they'll get mad. So I'll just avoid that. And after a while, we get tired of avoiding it. We start doing it again. And then we're back to the counselor. So it's just a repeat session and it goes on and on. It never really solves a problem. That's been my experience as a priest. This 
is not the avenue that needs to be taken. It's a dead end. So one way to make the two images one is to consider the parable of the sower and the seed. St. Teresa of Jesus liked to talk about your soul, about our souls, uh, inhabited by people. The faculties of the soul, the intellect, the will, the memory, the appetites, they're like people inside the soul. So we can kind of take those various people and put them inside. We look at this parable of the sower and the seed. There's three things to consider. There's the land, there's the seed, and there's the sower. We know that the sower is God. We know the seeds are His graces. We can consider them also as like His consolations, His inspirations, His working in our soul. And then there's the land. That's our soul. And there are four types of land, aren't there? Let's go through the four types. There's the pathways, the wayside. There's are nothing but habitual sins in us. These sins can be big or little, mortal or venial, hopefully not mortal, but that can happen. In either case, the devil uses them to tempt us and get us to fall over and over again. It's the easiest place for him to come and tempt us because, well, it's worn in. It's a pathway. It doesn't have to work very hard. Sometimes he can just let us go for a while. But he knows we've got this habit and it seems like we're making progress and then he comes and he tickles that little thing and bang, we're down. Because we've got a habit there. There's a, there's a pathway there. Conversely, because they're so trodden upon, we have to work extra hard, right? To dig them up and break up the compacted stone-like earth of which they are composed. Now, confession is only part of the answer. It removes the guilt, but not the habit. Of course, the more sorry you are in confession, the more it removes the actual habit itself. Recall that the birds or the fowls of the air devour the seeds spread upon the pathway. Although we usually think of the devil here, we can apply this to ourselves as well. How do I do that? Well, we, as it were, treat the graces of God with some contempt. Well, how do I do that? Well, we look at bad things. We read bad things. St. John Bosco said, speaking of our day, bad books will abound over the earth and the spirit of darkness will everywhere spread universal relaxation and everything concerning God's service. St. Philip Neri said that we should always read books that begin with an author whose name begins with the letter S. St. Thomas, St. Augustine, St. Teresa. St. John of the Cross, St. Francis de Sales, and so on. But we think on bad things, right? We look on bad things, even when we know we should not. Maybe even saying to ourselves, well, I'll just go to confession. We go to confession routinely without being really sorry for our sins, without conceiving a horror for sin. And consequently, we just sin again and again. See how the word is trampled underfoot by us? God is sowing seeds on those pathways. Overcome those pathways. Here's some grace. We we walk on it. This is coming down from the cross. Not accepting the graces that God has given me to overcome my my problems, my faults, my failings, my pathways. See how then we hold in a certain contempt for the graces God's given to us to overcome the pathways. So I ask you, Do we know our pathways in our soul? There's a way to find out without asking anybody else. That helps. That's the the pathways. How about the stony ground? Well, that can be taken as our faults, our character flaws. There are things that we've done for a long time. They're not sinful in themselves, but they can be used for sin. For example, they can be things like stubbornness. Now, stubbornness can be good if it's stubborn in the faith. Deny this faith. No, that's good. We want that kind of stubbornness. But people can be stubborn otherwise. Like, you know what your problem is? You know what your fault is? This is it. And they're like, oh, yeah, I'm not changing because of you. That's stubbornness. Or unwillingness to bend when you see the right because you don't want anybody to think that you are going to change because of them. Stubbornness or talkativeness. 
everything has to be a joke, that can be a fault. I've seen people make jokes out of everything. They, everything they say has got to be funny, including using the sacred scriptures. That shouldn't be done. St. Therese identified her, one of her stones as being oversensitivity. Sarcasm. Some people have to make sarcastic remarks about everything. Those are false. Stony, stony ground. Normally, there are things we grew up with. Some are passed on by our family and relatives. Others we picked up along the way. Oh, they need to be pulled up and made into a beautiful grotto for Our Lady. They can be transformed. They can be used for good. How often does it happen that people reach a certain point in their spiritual life and then what? They give up. Why? They don't want to go any further. Why? Because they feel like, well, that's me. This is who I am. I cannot help it. Get used to it. That's coming down from the cross. It's unwillingness to cooperate with God to take those stones and transform them into a grotto. Some place where we can adore God in our soul and honor His mother. So we do we know the stony ground in our souls? There's a way to find out without having to ask anybody else. Then, how about the thorny ground? Well, that represents our worldly attachments. Worldly attachments. How many of us are attached to things in our life and find ourselves working hard to preserve them or even getting more of the same? Now, maybe food. I love these cookies. I don't anybody else to find them, so I'm going to hide them in certain places. It may be things even so small. St. Therese had trouble with paintbrushes. Someone would use her paintbrushes. She would get upset. She was attached to them. These things get in the way of God working in our life. They choke off the good that God has planned for us. We know about our attachments by our behavior. We know it by our behavior, by our unwillingness to let things go, sad when they're used by others or sad when they are gone, upset when others take them or fear we fear their loss. So we know by our fear how much we think about them during the day, etc. So do we know the thorns in our soul? There's a way to find out. I'll give you a few hints. Listen to St. Teresa of Jesus. She says, Whoever has humility and detachment can easily go out and fight with all hell together and against the whole world and all its occasions of sin. Wow. Whoever has humility and detachment, we're talking about detachment, can go out and fight easily with all hell together and against the whole world and all its occasions of sin. Wow. Something we should want to be able to do. Finally, there's the good soil. We often exaggerate this part of our soul. Everybody seems to know it. I know what my good points are. And we always are able to identify it. But we seem to be blind to the other types of soil, right? Yet everyone else knows the other kinds of soil in our soul. And they don't notice maybe that fertile soil. See, there's always this battle going on. But anyway, they see right through us. So in any case, the good soul represents our virtues, our talents, to some degree, our goodwill and our strengths. Everyone has them to some degree. Now, but we must not be satisfied with the little we have. We have to change our whole soul into the fertile ground. Would that our entire soul were this fertile ground, this, this good soil, this Homus, homus, humility, rich soil. This is possible as the saints have shown us and it needs to be done. Now is the time to start. So how do I do this? Hmm. Well, one of the ways to do it is we need a mirror. Now we can look in our face. We can look at ourselves. We can see our bodies. We've got mirrors for that. But I need a mirror into my soul. How do I get a mirror into my soul? I can't buy that. I need to construct it. I need to construct a mirror. What you do is you get a little notebook. This is based completely on tradition and I've given you a little handout on this. You can take this home and, or even today and study it and consider how you would like to carry it out in your life. But one of the saints, St. John Climacus, speaks about how these monks had a little notebook on their belt 
And when something went wrong that day or they did something they wanted to remember, they just quickly wrote down a note. And so what you do is, is you get a little notebook. You're not journaling. You're noting where you do something that you are at fault or you're having some thought or you've spoken something. So you just jot it down and you get a body of knowledge built up. And with this body of knowledge, after about a couple of weeks or a month of taking little notes, just little notes, you don't need a bunch. You don't want to write too much because it'll take too much time to decipher or figure it all out or you'll be wading through it all. So you just write enough like, I complained about this, got mad at this person when they did this. Uh, what comes out of your mouth? Who do you meet during the day and speak to about other people and things like that? You write that down and you get a body of knowledge. And with this body of knowledge, you now have the ability to construct a mirror into your soul. You'll see something going on over and over and over and over. Oh, got a pathway there. What are my thoughts during my prayers? What are my distractions? If you want to draw close to God... He's going to say, okay, I want you to become perfect. I'm going to let you be distracted now. If God wants to take away our distractions, He can. Haven't you ever had prayer where you're completely at peace, you don't remember anything, or you don't think about anything but God? He can do that all the time, but He doesn't. He allows you to be distracted. Distractions are not our enemies. They're our friends. We should fight them when we're praying. They're sort of our enemy when we're praying. But after we're done praying, there are friends. Okay, what was I distracted about? You write it down. I was distracted about this. And then you just, just put it away. Don't think about it too much. Just do it over about a couple of weeks. Then you get enough information. You can see, okay, I'm, this is what God's showing me. It's wrong with me. Here's my distractions during prayers. Here's what I'm, here's what I'm complaining about. Here's what I'm afraid of. Anyway, it's all explained on this little piece of paper. You can construct a soul mirror. You can start to look into your soul and you'll see some things and you can find something new uh, to start working on or new things about yourself maybe you didn't know. You're looking for the smoke. That's what you're writing down in your notebook. The fire is what you want to put out. Once you find the smoke, you can find the fire. Maybe there's an old resentment that hasn't been taken care of. Maybe there's a broken relationship somewhere that needs to be healed and you're still angry about this. These kind of things are what fuel these faults, these pathways. Once you find them, you can get rid of them by praying them away with God's help. He'll be very happy that you've gone to this level to find true knowledge about yourself. He will help you. And besides, it makes confession in a pretty easy when you got that little notebook you start knowing yourself okay that's that's the ground soul mirrors is how we find what it looks like in our soul through a soul mirror you can find the stony ground thorny ground pathways and the fertile ground now we got to look at the seed our lord is sowing the seed that's grace our job is to respond to that grace. Otherwise, we come down from the cross. He's always giving us seeds to fight. St. Paul says, we entreat you not to accept the grace of God in vain. Okay, here again we find the cross because we can see, using St. Thomas Aquinas, that there are two basic kinds of grace, two categories of functions of grace. One's called gratia elevans, it elevates. And then there's gratia sanans, grace that heals. Two functions of grace. One elevates, the other heals. Gra uh, gratia elevans, of course, includes sanctifying grace of baptism. You're elevated. After mortal sin, go to confession. Sincere, integral, truly sorry, wanting to amend your life. Elevans. We can also think of the elevating graces like consolations during prayer, uh, illumination, like all of a sudden, I get it. That could be elevating grace. Things we often feel, very consoling. But then there's that healing grace. So the elevating grace, that's vertical bar on the cross. Then there's gratia sanans, healing grace. That's grace is given by God to overcome what? The pathways. 
stony ground, thorny ground. That's why he's sowing the seed on that ground. It's to be healed. Now, a sick person will not get better unless he actually takes the medicine that's been given to him. Here's the medicine. So healing graces are like the horizontal bar of the cross since they're given to aid us in overcoming our fallen human nature. Will you feel them? Here's the key. No, you won't feel them. I go to communion, Father, and I don't feel anything. That's because God's given you a whole bunch of healing graces. You're not feeling them. Elevating graces, that's like the vertical bar of the cross. They place us on the supernatural level. Since man is a sinner and suffering from the effects of original sin, God is going to provide more gratia sanans in our daily life than He is elevating graces until you're ready. You have to go high up in the spiritual life to start receiving those elevating graces on a daily basis. We're not ready for them. We're too, we'd be too prideful if we received them now. So we meet, need to work with Him to overcome these difficult places in our life. He's given us the help every day at communion. We'll talk about that later. Put a bookmark there. Now, we can also notice that the spiritual life then has what? It has two elements. It's always got the cross. All of the Christianity has got the cross somewhere hidden, hidden in it. So we look at the spiritual life. Spiritual theology, as we would study it in the seminary, is divided into two parts. The mystical and the ascetical. Vertical is the mystical. Horizontal is the ascetical. They go together. We always have to have the mystical and the ascetical together. Many people, let's face it, want just the mystical. They want to have all these mystical experiences, but they don't want to do the ascetical. The ascetical is that turning over that ground, that, that pathway, the hard work, then taking those stones up, making them into a grotto. That's the ascetical. That's penance. That's mortification. Practicing virtue. Avoiding sin. Now I'd like to end with an example of how this can be done. Let's consider Venerable Matt Talbot at the turn of the 20th century. As a young teen, I think at 13, he started to become a grave drinker, a great drunk. He even sold his shirt and shoes once for drink and would frequently beg for drinks like a dog. Obviously, this man has a very, very serious pathway. It is hardened and it's well-trodden. He lived his life as a drunk for over 10 years, something like 13 he was in debt to everyone because of his habits. He was always living for himself. He didn't care about anybody else. He didn't do anything for anybody else out of any sort of generosity. Just about himself. He was very selfish. So how pertinent to our times when many Americans are terribly addicted to something or other and deep in debt. Matt Talbot. What pathways he had. Maybe we've got him too. Well, he started by taking the pledge for three months. He did not trust himself. He did it with a good priest. Took the pledge. This was sort of his first Lent. He said it was the most difficult. Then he pledged for six months after that. Then he pledged forever. He said the first three months were the most torturous because he got to dig up that hard ground with a pickaxe. Dynamite. Very hard. But it can be done, and he shows it can be done. He did not carry any money for fear of temptation. Shows you that he was really sorry and was trying hard. Once he went into a bar, but miraculously he was ignored. Not being served anything. He left. His angel was taking care of him, and his mother and sisters were praying for him. He went to confession weekly. He spent his spare time reading and praying and singing hymns, especially to Our Lady. He read many spiritual books and took notes. He wanted to master the spiritual life. He would wake up in the middle of the night and sing songs to Our Lady. He went to Mass two times a day 
on the weekdays at 5.30 a.m. and 6.30 a.m. in two different churches before going to work. You could do that in Dublin, Ireland. That's where he's from. But he went three times on Sundays. Of course, he only received communion at one Mass. Uh, and sometimes, I don't know if he received communion at all. But he went to Mass two times a day on weekdays and three times on Sundays. He visited the churches after work to pray, and he always knelt erect when praying. In other words, there was this ascetical life. They go together. He meditated on the mysteries of our Lord and His Mother. He prayed the rosary often. Most of his money went to those in need, taking no account of his personal retirement. He did not buy new clothes, but always looked neat and tidy and clean. When he died, the hospital personnel were amazed at his cleanliness. They found one chain around his knee embedded in the skin. He wore chains as a sign of his slavery to the Blessed Virgin after the example of St. Louis de Montfort. He was consecrated to her. Ascetical life. He had the mystical life too. This one gal wanted to marry him and he was kind of caught off guard that someone would care for him that much. And he was not knowing what to do. And he went to prayer and he prayed and he prayed and prayed. What should I do? And our lady came to him and said, no, you're mine. You're not to get married. He did not eat meat and fasted often. He was energetic, cheerful, and always healthy. He never missed a day of work. He paid all his debts and helped many other people overcome their own habits. He died suddenly outside a church after two Masses that day. It was a Sunday. He was on his way to his third Sunday Mass, and he died. He was 69. What an example of how prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, which is the mystical and ascetical life combined, that's the cross, can convert all pathways, stony and thorny ground of our souls, into fertile land. Let us then take one of these little handouts of the soul mirrors, and we can look at that between now and the next conference. Last time we mentioned that the spiritual life is composed of the ascetical and mystical elements with graces being, as it were, supplied to both. Grazia elevans for the mystical, grazia sanas for the ascetical. This is our cross. We fail to take up our cross when we fail to respond to the graces that have been given to us. Now, for this conference, let us focus on the virtues that compose the spiritual life. The theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, that's like the vertical of our cross again. We're always having to carry a cross. So the vertical, faith, hope, and charity, they are proportional to God. They are a connection with God. They are all that we have that is proportional to God, St. John of the Cross says. We'll address those in the next talk faith, hope, and charity, theological virtues. Now then there's the moral virtues. The moral virtues are about our life here on earth. They make life here able to be perfected in every way. These virtues fall under the four cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, temperance, and courage. And the saints like Thomas Aquinas and others teach us that it is impossible to live a completely virtuous life without grace, without the cross, the vertical, that gratia elevans, and the gratia sanans. So, in other words, in the past, we've had various virtuous people that were naturally virtuous. Plato, or, or Socrates, or Cicero, or Aristotle. But they weren't completely virtuous. None of them were completely virtuous because you can't be completely virtuous without God's grace. It's impossible. Let's talk about virtue for a few moments. Virtue is sometimes called a second nature. It enables us to do things with great ease. Makes its possessor good. It'll make you good and your actions good. It's sort of like adorning ourselves with gems. You know, it's beautiful. When you see someone with virtue, you're like, wow, they're beautiful. 
You go to St. Peter's Basilica. All throughout the Basilica, there's these beautiful statues of various virtues. They're all women. Because virtue requires grace. So the seed is given by God. That's the grace. The woman, the virtue, does something with it. And that's a virtuous act. All the virtues in Latin are feminine in gender. But you go throughout St. Peter's Basilica, there's all these beautiful statues of women. Also, we can think that virtue gives order to life. We're able to order things according to God's law, according to God's plan. We can order things to heaven. And order, that brings harmony. Virtue is harmonious life. brings a harmonious life. It brings a certain proportion in our life. Things are done in a proportional way. When you see that, you go, hey, that's beautiful. Wow, look how he did that. He didn't do too much. He didn't do too little. He wasn't excessive. He wasn't defective. He was right on the mark. Certain proportionality. That due proportion strikes us as beautiful. Inspiring. Now, to understand how these virtues work, we need to understand a little bit about our human psychology. And that's why I gave you this little handout. Unfortunately, I didn't learn this until I went to the seminary. Oh, if only I'd known these things when I was younger. This is so important. These are almost like little secrets that shouldn't be secret at all. Well, anyway, we look at the human being and how they're made. True human psychology is study of the soul. Psycho psych psyche is from the Greek for soul. So the modern notion of psychology is actually not the right notion of psychology. True psychology literally means study of the soul of man. So when we look at the soul of man, we see that it's broken down, as it were, into various faculties and appetites. Once again, St. Teresa of Jesus liked to speak of these as being people inside of the soul. There's like there's people inside of you. And sometimes you can kind of feel it, don't you? Like you have a little conflict in there. You know, you can't get along. People aren't relating to each other. Hey, you guys get along. Come on, let's work this out. Well, what are these people? Well, there's the intellect. What does the intellect do? Well, it knows truth and falsehood. That's what it does, at least in part. Then we have the will. The will is where we know good or we will the good, we choose the good and avoid the bad. And then there's the memory, of course. We remember things. And then we have the appetites. The appetites are broken into two major parts. There's the concupiscible appetite and there's the irascible appetite. Now, the concupiscible appetite, that's just basically the appetite in us that wants to unite things to me. I want things for me. So it's always trying to unite things to me. The irascible appetite, that's our, as it were, fight or flight mechanism. It's going to help me get what it wants, what needs to be done if it's difficult. Or it takes a flight if it can't be done. It's also, it's like self-defense. We look at these appetites, the concupiscible appetite. That's where the emotions of love, hate, and joy are located. I love cheesecake, for example. So that's where that's coming from, the concupiscible appetite. Or I hate peas, see? Concupiscible appetite. Okay. And I have joy. You have that, that little joy when you eat something that you like. Oh, mm. that's coming from the concupiscible appetite. Then there's the irascible appetite. That has the, the emotions of fear in it. And this is partly where scruples comes from. The, the irascible appetite gets too powerful. It rears up and it makes you afraid against your reason, your right reason. It pushes aside the will and the intellect says, ah, be afraid, be afraid. You know, ah, you're afraid. But that's the irascible appetite getting out of control. Anger is in the irascible appetite. That's where the word comes from. Irascible. Ira is a, the base word for anger in Latin. And then you got hope. Well, I hope that there's some cheesecake tonight for dinner. That's, that, that's where that hope is. Not the hope for heaven. You're just hoping for, for human things. I hope 
that supper is made when I get home. I hope my bed's made up, etc., etc. Let's just give an example. Let's say there's a big dog coming at you. I'm going to fight this dog or I'm going to flee from this dog. I've had some experience with dogs. I think I can handle him. Then your rasp appetite flares up and you take him on. My brother was once mountain biking back in the woods. We're from Montana. And this lady came along with a big dog and the dog began to come at him at full speed and to attack him. And he decided he would take him on. And he jumped off his mountain bike, put the mountain bike between him and the dog and pulled out his air pump and let him have it on the nose. Now, a dog is very sensitive on his nose. But he used his right reason, prudence, saw that he could handle it. Dog jumped up, wham, let him have it. And the dog was on the ground flailing around because he wasn't expecting that. But that was his irascible appetite came forward. I'm not letting this dog get me. And he let him have it. If you're going to climb a mountain, irascible appetite. If you're going to fight a battle, irascible appetite's got to kick in. Some people, well, today in our culture, they're really seeking pleasure. And they get sick of pleasure. Then they go to the irascible appetite and they do adventure seeking, bungee jumping, roller coasters, all that stuff. That's what they're doing is twanging the irascible appetite, okay? That's what they're doing. Because they've had enough of the concupiscible. Now, let's go back to the concupiscible. It's very important what I'm going to teach you here. Very important. It's in levels. At the very bottom level of the concupiscible appetite is the desire to unite to myself food and drink. If you're starving... That's the number one thing you want. You don't want sleep. You want food and drink. So the first thing you're looking for is to fill your belly. It doesn't even matter what, how tasty it is. All you want is some food and drink. Okay, that's the basic level of our concupiscible appetite. It always wants to unite to itself food and drink. Then sleep. After you've had enough to eat, what's the next response? Oh, I'm tired now. It's time to go to sleep. And you'll sleep upon the hard ground if you're really sleepy. It doesn't matter. But once you've had enough food and enough drink regularly, well, now you want not the hard ground. You want a soft bed. So you want the more pleasurable things in life. Hot shower, soft bed, heated house, etc., etc. Comfortable clothing, pleasurable things. So the seat kind of goes up. And then finally is the marital embrace. Now, if we can control, this is a very important lesson, if we can control ourselves down at the food and drink and sleep area, we can control ourselves at the higher levels. We don't let it get to the higher level, we won't have any trouble up there. You could put a thermometer by this if you wanted to and eat all the food and drink you want, temperature starts going up. Sleep all you want, temperature starts going up. Get all the pleasurable things you want, hot shower and everything, temperature starts going up. It starts getting pretty hot. See? It starts getting out of control. It starts boiling over. And this is what's wrong with our society because everybody out there is eating and drinking basically anything they want, sleeping all they want, doing all the pleasurable things they want, and then they get themselves into trouble. That is a secret, as it were, unfortunately. It shouldn't be a secret of the spiritual life. Control yourself down below, you'll control yourself above. How are the monks and the nuns and the saints so many thousands of years since Jesus came even before, how are they able to control themselves, keep their vows perfectly intact? They didn't eat and drink and sleep all they wanted. It's really that simple. Human psychology, you understand it, you'll understand many things. Now, Teresa's people in the soul. Well, the faculties, their intellect, the memory, the will, the appetites. These all need to be perfected. They need to get along. So there's going to be a virtue for each one. Each one of them will have a virtue attached to it or in it to perfect it, to control it, to order it. We could also just review that levels of the concupiscible appetite just to keep with our theme. If you don't keep things at the lower level, you're dropping your cross. That's your cross. Let me give some ideas of how to do that. Got a snooze alarm. 
Take it outside. Take the hammer to it. Don't be messing around getting up in the morning. Just get up. If you say you're going to get up at 6, then get up at 6. That's the way to do it. When you get out of bed, we'll talk about this in a moment. At least you'll see the reason why. Make the sign of the cross and say, I'm doing this for the love of God and salvation of souls. If I didn't do that in the morning, I would get a snooze alarm. I want to get out of bed because that's the right thing to do and it's for the love of God. If I'm just getting out of bed because, well, if I don't, my community will be mad at me or everybody will be thinking I'm lazy or I don't want people to think about me, that's not the right reason to get out of bed. The reason to get out of bed is because you love God. And you should make the first act of your day an act of humility. So oftentimes in religious life in the past, they would jump out of bed and even kiss the ground to make a first act of the morning an act of love and an act of humility. That's a way we can put our ascetical life into action. Not taking long showers, maybe some cold in there. That's ascetical life. That's keeping that concupiscible down lower, keeping you under control. Drinking only water, etc., etc. Those kind of things. Not sleeping in, no cold showers, no snooze alarms. What time are we going to get up in the morning? Now, a little trick here is that you can get the irascible appetite to work against the concupiscible as well because if the concupiscible gets out of control, you can kind of get angry at it. Enough of that. You're getting out of bed. You're going, you're going to get up. You're going to have that cold shower. You don't like it, do you? Well, tough, you see. Get angry at sin. Get angry at your indulgences. And you start, for that, I'm going to get you. And you start doing more penance. That's many a times what the saints would do. That's using your human psychology properly. Now, St. Teresa's people in the soul, they need to get along. Let's talk about how that's going to happen. Well, we look at the cardinal virtues. How are they all going to work? They need to work according to reason. Oh, I left one thing out. I'm sorry. Oh, this is so important. All right. Intellect, memory, will, appetites, right? All right, God works from the top down. He always informs you, gives you a word, you respond. He always works this way. He doesn't work this way. That's the way the devil works. He always tries to get you low in your appetites, and then he tries to work up to convince you of something that's wrong and lies. You'll be like God. Here's a tree, here's an apple, here. And then he tries, after he's got you enticed, then he tries to tell you, you'll be like God. He always works this direction. God works this direction. It's very important, especially in what's happening to us today. Because today, for example, is one of the best is music. Music, we have a soft spot in our souls for music. This is why Plato outlawed music from his Republic. He knew that it was very dangerous. It could affect people. Where that music hits you determines how good it is. If the music hits you here, bad. To be avoided at all costs. Don't listen to it. It's not good. Even if it's got such so-called good lyrics, good words, doesn't matter. It's backwards. God doesn't work like that. So I'm talking about rock and roll now. Rock and roll hits you here, down in the, in, in the lower appetites. And then it, if you give in to it, then you start opening your heart and your mind to things you have no idea because you're working backwards. God works like this. So the higher level music, even though it may not feel immediately like something, it'll work its way down and eventually it'll bring harmony. What's the highest level music we can listen to? or participate in Gregorian chant. What's the next highest? Probably choral music, polyphony. Then it goes down, maybe to folk at the lower level. Folk probably hits you more in the heart, which is okay. But it's when you get rock and roll and you get rap really bad. It hits you down low. I'll tell you a little secret about that is that in engineering, we learned that everything has a natural frequency. Okay, everything has a natural frequency. 
A good example would be if I took a guitar, which is a musical instrument, and I took it to my lab, and I have a noisemaker there. They make these things that make noise. And you can, you can adjust the, the, the dial, and it'll send out a wave at this certain frequency. Now, I just put the guitar over there on the bench, and I turn my noisemaker on, and I begin to twiddle with it until I get it to a certain point. All of a sudden, that guitar string will start to vibrate all on its own. The, the waves that are hitting it are its natural frequency. You won't be able to hear it very loud, but it'll be there because the natural frequency has been struck in the air around it, and it's starting to vibrate along with it. Okay. That's true of us, too. We have our own natural frequency. We're like that guitar string. So, in rock and roll music is specially designed to hit our natural frequency. So, a frequency is going to be a wave. So, when the music is being played, what's the normal reaction of a human being listening to rock and roll music? They want to what? They want to move like a guitar string. They can't help it. And so, if you look at dancing People who dance according to the older right, old music, like a waltz or something, it's ordered. It has order to it and harmony. If you look at rock and roll music and you look at the dancing going on with rock and roll music, there's no harmony, no order, because you can't order it. And so what happens? They just jiggle. Okay? It's really gross. It's not healthy for our spiritual life. Okay, that's just to show you that if something hits you lower, it's not right. If it hits you here, it may be okay. If it go either way, maybe. If it hits you high, it's safe. Okay. That means that you can't take rock and roll music and baptize it. But Father, it's got Christian rock. It's Christian music. It's got Christian uh, words. God doesn't work this way. He works this way. That's what understanding true human psychology can really help you discern. Okay, now let's talk about the individual virtues briefly. First of all, they all have to be according to right reason. That's what makes them virtuous, according to right reason. Prudence regards the right reason about what is to be done. That's how St. Thomas defines it. Prudence is right reason about things to be done. Justice regards right reason in treating others as they deserve. So it's doing what is right. Courage helps the person do what is right in the face of danger. It removes obstacles to doing what is right. And temperance prevents one from turning away from what is right on account of the lower appetites, according to their tastes and desires. Okay, so let's go to prudence. This is one of the most important ones. All right, think of the person of the intellect inside of our souls. We've been talking about St. Teresa's persons. This person needs to have glasses on. When you're born with original sin, you come out of the womb, you don't have any grace, you grow up, you don't have any grace, you have no prudence, no supernatural prudence, you have no glasses on. You can kind of see things, but you'll hit your head against the wall a lot trying to figure things out. Well, once you have grace... Then you get prudence, okay? All of a sudden, you get some glasses. Not only are they single-lens glasses, they're bifocals. So the upper lenses are faith. You can see unto heaven, all right? You can see unto heaven. That helps you. You can see God, as it were, in faith. The Eucharist is held up. God, all right. Now, the lower lenses, that's prudence. That's ordering Things, right reason about things to be done. Now I can order my life properly. With my bifocals, I can see the locally how to get to the final destination. Okay, so we need those glasses. But what's important here is, as just mentioned, how each of these cardinal virtues has to do with right reason about something, about giving to another what they deserve, about overcoming some difficulty, about or keeping the concupiscible appetite in check. Prudence, then, is a virtue that everything needs to check in with. Okay, So all of them need to be checking in with prudence. If I'm going to do a just act, it must check in with prudence. If I'm going to do a courageous act, it must be done under prudence. 
If I'm going to be temperate, it must be done according to right reason, which is prudence. What I'm saying is this. If we don't have prudence, it's not virtue. We must be prudent in all of our actions if they are going to count, if they're going to be virtuous, if they're going to be meritorious. So if we don't check in with prudence, guess what? You drop your cross. You fail to take up your cross. It won't be meritorious. How can we fail in prudence? I mean, I do it all the time. I'm sure you do too. We're hasty. We are hasty. We do something too quickly. We don't think about it. We're thoughtless. Didn't think everything through. We neglect to judge things properly. We're inconstant. So that's how we drop our crosses. In other ways, that's a defect in prudence. We're, remember, we're talking about the cross here. The horizontal bar is the moral virtues. Since they're the horizontal bar, they have excess and defect. The vertical bar, that's the theological virtues. They will not have any excess. But the moral virtues, those we have for this life, excess defect. So defect in prudence, hastiness, thoughtlessness, inconstancy. But hastiness is a big one. We're just too hasty in this life. We don't stop and think about, is this good for my, my God? Will this please Him? How would, what would I think about this on my deathbed? Is this ordered to eternity? What is this to all eternity? What is this to heaven? Do we ask ourselves that in dealing with our daily life? We will make good decisions if we do that. We're going to buy something. What's this to eternity? Am I really need this? How is this going to help me get to heaven? See, now you're thinking in terms of prudence and you're taking up your cross. Chances are you might not buy as much stuff if you thought like that. Maybe that's why no one wants to talk about this because they're like, well, I don't want to think about it. Then there's an excess of prudence. That's where we're crafty. You know, we're really good about getting what we want. We can talk others into getting what we want. Or we're vicious in our worries about the future. Very common today. Where we start to, as it were, plan every little detail so that we're completely secure in this life. We have enough food for two years. We've got ammo for our guns to protect ourselves for a decade. You know, that kind of thing. Storing up treasures, food and guns for a future disaster that may never come. And even if it does come, it might be better to die at the beginning than to try to hold out. The only thing reason not hold out is because I'm a priest and I would want people to help be able to go to confession and die a holy death. But still, you think about it. What? What does it say in the Bible again? We have no home here. We are exiles here. What does it say in the Bible? Do not be anxious about your life. What does it say in the Bible? The cares of the world choke the word. You see, it doesn't jive, does it? All that scheming and vicious worry about, ah, I've got to be prepared. Better be prepared for a holy and a happy death than to have enough food to last two, or two years. I'm not criticizing having enough food to last some kind of a natural disaster like a big storm or something like that. That's just prudent because you can help a lot of people do, survive a storm. But to have two years and guns and all that, hmm, I don't know about that. One more thing we can talk about is that we need to be manly in these difficult times. Now I'm talking more about like courage. St. Thomas Aquinas says that effeminacy is where we, we're sad, we're sorrowful, that we have to give up the pleasurable thing. And so we become effeminate. Well, how does that happen now? Well, because we've inclined our soul so much to pleasure and there's so many sources of pleasure in our life. One of the main sources is all the technological advancements we've made. Our life becomes very pleasurable. We've got gadgets that are fun to use for everything in our life. We've got smartphones and video games and internet access and all these little neat technological gadgetry 
And it, what ends up happening is, is that we fail to do the difficult and arduous good. That's what it means to be a man, to do the difficult and arduous good. Now, St. Teresa, she wanted manly nuns, so this isn't just about men as a gender. It's about everybody. We need to be manly. Manly people do the difficult and arduous good. You're willing to take that cold shower because it's difficult and arduous. That's the manly thing to do. You're willing to forego that drink or that dessert or whatever it is because that's the difficult and arduous good. And it keeps my passions under control. It keeps them according to right reason. Let's keep these things in mind. That helps us from falling down from the cross. Think about Jesus carrying His cross to Calvary. That was a very manly thing to do. That was the most manly thing that could be done in all of history was to take that cross, which was the biggest and most heavy of all crosses because it had all of our sins loaded on it. And he carried it up to Calvary. And he died on it. That was a manly thing to do. What's the devil want us to do? Come down. Give up. That's too hard. He wants us to be girly, as it were, instead of manly. Do the difficult and arduous thing. So let us use our virtues Use our prudence. Everything's got to be checking in with prudence. That keeps us carrying the cross. Let us use our courage, our rascal appetite to do the manly good, to overcome the pleasures that the world is constantly barraging us with, and we won't drop our cross so readily. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.